we are live uh, hello everyone hello everyone we have a uh, we have a special guest today this live stream gonna be with a with a guest interview with a former member of parliament of united kingdom and uh, senior retired senior fellow uh, of uh, UK's Defense uh, Academy, Matthew Gordon Banks. Hello, Matthew. How are you? Hello. Good to be here. Oh, I'm very grateful for uh, uh, for you to find time to participate in in this live stream. Plenty of uh, topics to to discuss. Really, unfortunately, developments in the world are not as optimistic as we would like. And uh, if I may, I will go straight to questions and uh, first of all uh, i'm interested um, in your opinion about recent visit of zelensky in united uh, in the united states uh, do you think that visit was a success or the failure because after all he went for 61 billion us dollars as i understand from uh, biden's aid package but he get only 200 million so what is your take on on this well, you say only 200 million. It's an awful lot of money uh, on top of uh, an astronomically large sum of money uh, that he's already received. As to whether his visit was a success or failure, if I'm honest, I'm not too sure that it was necessarily either. Um, why was it that he went? Uh, some reports suggest that he was summoned by the Americans. Maybe the Biden administration thought he had to be there because they were struggling to get through, uh, get this money through uh, congressional approval. And perhaps they thought that his uh, presence, his glad handing and meeting with uh, Senator Chuck Schumer and Senator Mitch McConnell and everybody else, uh, whether that would help. Um, well, it's helped to a point. But I also think that perhaps behind the scenes, um, he may well have been given a wide variety of advice, advice which the Biden administration is not making public. Um, it may be a long time before we hear about that. Uh, we'll see. So um, I think his trip was neither a success uh, nor a failure. Um, but... Um, uh, he's also caught, really, in the middle of what is essentially domestic politics. Uh, even yes. Republican leaders like Senator Mitch McConnell are towing the line of their congressional colleagues in the lower house um, who are saying, look, if we're spending all of this money uh, on Ukraine, we really ought to be doing more particularly in relation to our own immigration and border problems here at home in the United States. Um, so um, neither success nor failure. Um, Zelensky limps on to a very, very uncertain future, but it's not one that I'm going to one day describe as victory. Uh -huh. uh, to continue the topic of uh, Ukraine, um, what is your take on current developments uh, in in Ukraine on the on the front line? Uh, how you will assess? Uh, does uh, uh, Zelensky and his government um, achieving much despite this uh, huge huge uh, support from NATO member states when it comes to financial aid or military aid, uh, which did reach hundreds of billions at this point? Uh, well, well, sticking first with, with Ukraine, um, uh, and also as a, a follower of your own programs and a member of your community as well. Um, uh, for which I'm grateful for. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm one of many. I know uh, everyone viewing this program uh, regards themselves as a, a member of the community. Um, the, the front line has been gradually and irrevocably moving from east to west. Russia and the, the armed forces of the Russian Federation have been making slow, uh, methodical gains. Uh, 
we are seeing now uh, a similar scenario in Avdivka uh, that we uh, saw in Bakhmut, Artyomovsk. Yes. Uh, and in inevitably, uh, Avdivka is being surrounded uh, uh, and it will fall. It will capitulate. And you have said many times on your programs in the recent past that you anticipate, and I think you're right, that uh, not only are there the, 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 the military advance of Russian forces, uh, but the very real prospect that a considerable number of Ukrainian service personnel uh, will actually lay down their weapons uh, and become prisoners of war. Uh, the, the fight is, is almost uh, futile. Um, and uh, against the changes that we're seeing on the front line, uh, and again, you yourself have pointed to the uh, the, the small uh, bridgehead that people in the West talk about uh, around uh, Krinky on the uh, yes. east bank of the Dnieper River. Um, all along, I think it has been a Russian trap. And uh, every time... Uh, Ukraine sends more and more forces over the river, they are killed, uh, and it's going nowhere. It's a disaster. But we're talking at a, a very important moment because not just are there Russian advances on the front line, with um, uh, Ukraine now taking up defensive positions, having no possibility of breaking out into a, a further, a further so-called offensive. But uh, in the last uh, couple of days, we've started seeing uh, some uh, Russian targeted bombing raids uh, in Kiev itself. And as we head to the very deepest, darkest winter with temperatures uh, dropping, uh, people in the capital uh, are now seeing that their mobile phones don't work or build buildings are being destroyed. They are usually targeted. They're almost never um, deliberately, indiscriminately bombed. Uh, but uh, infrastructure is going to be very, very important. Uh, and Russian forces are are, um, are destroying uh, both service military manpower and the uh, uh, Ukrainian war effort, uh, both on the front line and and in the capital city. And and the latter, the reason that I mentioned the the the, the recent bombings, which have started and I think will continue, is that this will sap at the very heart of morale. Uh, within the Ukrainian government and emphasize, um, and it's already widely known by many civilians in the Ukrainian capital and in Western Ukraine, uh, that um, uh, Ukraine is not winning this conflict, uh, it's losing, and it's time really to start talking and having negotiations uh, with the Russian Federation. Uh, which I'm sure are going to start to take place proper in 2024. Uh, you just mentioned a very important topic, which definitely has a direct um, connection with the uh, internal politics of, of Ukraine. Uh, as you uh, rightly um, appointed, the um, Russian side quite actively targeting military and logistical infrastructure of, uh, uh, of Ukraine, of the regime, including in capital, and uh, as winter comes, of course, uh, issue of uh, electricity and warm will become uh, a big and, uh, of course, uh, unhappy, unhappy uh, residents of Kiev will uh, direct their anger, probably in the direction of uh, Zelensky and his uh, government. And in this regard, in this regard, do you see uh, further risk that? Uh, relationships in, inside the Ukraine between the possible camps, let's say uh, Zelensky, Zaluzhny, head of general staff, or, or Budanov even, uh, three major camps. Do you see that relationships will, will escalate even further 
as a result of this internal turmoil and unhappiness increase in in uh, in uh, critics criticism of government from the population it will probably have something to do with this 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 uh, strikes that uh, are taking place last several days in a row uh, uh, yes i think the um the uh the sheer unhappiness um of the civilian population um uh, is increasing several fold as uh, as each week passes but we have to remember that um free speech um is almost impossible in in ukraine um the media is very very tightly controlled government controlled um some 15 political parties have been banned um it's very difficult i wonder at what stage uh uh, General Zeluzhny, for example, uh, might seek, uh, having not had much of his military advice to the Ukrainian president taken on board and acted upon. For example, uh, Zelensky is making them fight for Avdivka when it's well known that yes. Zeluzhny has wanted to concentrate on building some new defensive positions and we saw some 60,000 plus Ukrainian soldiers die for so very little in trying to hang on to Bakhmut which really had no strategic importance whatsoever. Um, the situation is different in Avdivka because if and when Russian forces take Avdivka uh, that will give them control of the Donbass, and that will be much more, uh, much more significant. Uh, so I think that um, civilians um, are, uh, and the population of Ukraine, are getting more and more upset. Life is becoming more and more difficult for them. Basic commodities like food are becoming more and more difficult to obtain and are becoming more expensive. And then, of course, there's the infighting within various organs of the state, which you've alluded to, um, where, where they are beginning to kill each other now. Trying, at least. Uh, just recently, there was an incident with wife of Budanov, head of uh, Ukraine's military intelligence. And even Ukrainian channels on, uh, on the Telegram, for example, are uh, pointing out that possibly it was uh, Zelensky's camp. Although usually they are everything, they, they usually blame Russia for everything. But in this particular case, this inner confrontation, internal confrontation is uh, so obvious that uh, sides are not even trying now to blame for, for Moscow for everything. And to continue this topic exactly of uh, internal confrontation uh, in between the camps in, in Ukraine, uh, how you will assess uh, prospects of Zelensky? Uh, as a current head of Ukraine, how long he will hold on to power? Uh, it's, it's, I guess, big question now in Ukraine itself. Uh, and people are wondering when some changes will take place. And do you see uh, from the Western side, from the Western ruling class, uh, attempts to somewhat distance themselves from this uh, mess that uh, modern Ukraine have become and, and all the failures on, on behalf of the regime? Uh, well, there's quite a lot to cover there, isn't there? Um, Zelensky um, uh, is not long for the Ukrainian presidency. Um, in my mind, uh, it's merely a, a matter of whether he flees with uh, perhaps some Ukrainian, perhaps even British assistance um, and leaves the country. Um, his negotiating position is zero. Um, he has made it quite clear uh, that uh, it's uh, going to be victory at all costs. And um, uh, much of that, of course, we now know after two years nearly of conflict, um, uh, it's always been nonsense, uh, right from the word go. But I think he, I think he, um, uh, he is a non-starter so far as Moscow is concerned. Moscow won't negotiate with him any more than I suspect that they will negotiate with Budanov, who, correct me if I'm wrong, um, 
the the Moscow authorities have um, uh, have made their position pretty clear fairly recently. Uh, so as to how long he has, I would have thought that um, uh, when Avdivka in particular falls, uh, there may be a watershed uh, in 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 the whole scenario. Uh, I I would have thought by summer the situation will look very different indeed in fact i do think even by the end of january 2024 that things will uh, look uh, different um uh, from uh, today but what when it starts to collapse i mean really collapse i think that things will potentially happen very, very quickly, which is why I suggest that um, uh, whilst I'm, I'm not entirely comfortable to say this, but the reality is that Zelensky could in fact be killed, I think it's more likely that he will flee in exactly the same way that uh, uh, the Afghan leader piled his family into uh, a plane with a whole mountain of cash uh, and uh, left the country. And I think to some extent, it's going to be a pretty un, uh, undignified end. I'm much taken though, um, looking at pictures of Zelensky um, over the last two years, and let's say two years before that, it doesn't seem very long ago that Zelensky looked really good in many ways, quite a young man. To look at him today, it's look, like looking at an entirely different person. Um, and I know that there have been suggestions that um, his drug addiction may well have got the better of him, something that I know that in your programs you've occasionally commented on, um, but it cannot be doing him any good. But he's got to go because there is a future uh, if people are sensible. If the United States and Washington in particular are sensible, there is a future for the rump of Ukraine. Um, but I'm afraid uh, since Boris Johnson's trip in particular, when he told Zelensky to throw the peace initiative in the bin, um, Ukraine has been put on a path that many Ukrainians will look back and think how stupid we were to pay any attention. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, it's likely that, um, uh, I would say certain, that uh, at least four or five uh, regions are currently regarded as part of East Ukraine, which are uh, four of whom are largely occupied now, uh, will become um, independent uh, and effectively uh, uh, part of the Russian Federation with uh, their own self-determination. It never needed to be this way. If the Minsk Accords had been implemented, Ukraine would have retained sovereignty and there would have been greater uh, local autonomy. Uh, that would have worked extremely well, but um, unfortunately... Uh, the Americans uh, and their British friends had other ideas. Yes, that's quite uh, unfortunate, really. And uh, I'm quite sure you are absolutely right. And that uh, in years to come, many citizens of Ukraine will probably look back what have been done, what kind of chances was lost uh, during uh, March, uh, during those negotiations, for example, in Istanbul that took place in March of 2022. And 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 it's uh, especially painful when you uh, read into details how how little Russia was uh, asking really not to join NATO and uh, to protect uh, rights of Russian speakers and that was it really. I, I think Levin, um, when when you say that, two things in particular come to my mind. Um, it was always known in Washington that. Ukrainian neutrality in relation to NATO was a red line for Moscow. Absolutely. And Russia has been saying the same thing since at least 2008. 
it's nothing new. Uh, and um, secondly, I'm very much uh, uh, very conscious of the fact that um, uh, the so-called um, failed invasion, as some in the West call it, um, it's quite clear that uh, President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, wanted his troops um, to, as a last resort, of course, to go into Ukraine, uh, and he had hoped um, with just some 90,000 troops that he would be able to show that he me meant business and that uh, Ukraine would, in fact, negotiate. Um, but it, it wasn't a, a failed invasion at all. All the way along, I am satisfied that the Russian Federation and its armed forces have been, in a sense, using the minimum force necessary in order to carry out this particular uh, special military operation. Because the truth is, uh, we talked a few moments ago about the uh, increased bombings in the uh, Ukrainian capital. If Moscow wanted to flatten Kiev, it could do so, but it hasn't done so. Um, hence the phrases, Russia is fighting with one arm tied behind its back. Uh, and it also convinces me to, to, to in my view, that uh, in no way does President Putin wish to try to take over uh, all of Ukraine, Western Ukraine. Um, he knows he's got a job on doing what he's trying to do at the present moment in time. And so that is why I say there is a future for a rump Ukraine. And I've always believed since the early days of this uh, conflict within the boundary of uh, the Ukrainian state, uh, I've always believed that ultimately there will, of course, be negotiations and the sooner the better. But I described what may follow as being a Cyprus situation. In 1974, the, uh, the Turks invaded northern Cyprus for the very reason of protecting uh, the uh, minority Turkish Muslim population. And uh, although it was against international law, arguably, today, some decades after, um, the two uh, sections of the island of uh, Cyprus um, work fairly well together. And many, many people from my own country go on holiday, both to the Republic of Cyprus in the south, controlled by Greek, Greek Cypriots, and many also go to the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus uh, in the north. Turkey, as far as I'm aware, is the only country in the world that recognizes northern Cyprus. But um, and a similar situation just might develop in eastern Ukraine. But I think a very similar model uh, is likely to come about in, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is, is not going to be joining NATO. Indeed, uh, Antony Blinken has recently got really rather cross with some European leaders for raising it and has told them, stop raising it. Ukraine's not going to be joining. And I think it's um, for all the talk from the uh, president of the European Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, they, they may well um, start talks about talks as, as they are doing. But uh, Ukraine is is years away from really being a suitable candidate for membership of the European Union. Um, it's lost so many of its men. It's got the lowest birth rate in the whole of Europe. Uh, there's so much work to do, but it can only start when there's a, a, a real ceasefire okay. and real negotiations, and frankly, a change of government and leadership in Kiev. Yes, absolutely, uh, absolutely. So, uh, <clears throat> well, there is hope for a uh, there is hope for a uh, for a peace uh, uh, supposed to be. And as you rightly uh, 
mentioned, I absolutely agree with you. Zelensky is non-negotiable from Moscow's point of view. Same goes for uh, Budanov and uh, quite possibly maybe uh, Zaluzhny will be the person who will uh, replace Zelensky at some point and uh, probably Moscow will have a talk uh, negotiations with, with Zaluzhny with active participation of the Western capitals, major, major capitals of the West. And also, I want to point out that I absolutely agree when you mentioned the uh, topic of force that Russia is um, using this, this special military operation. I guess everybody in this world now sees that Russia was very determined from the very first day to minimize casualties among civilians and uh, to see different difference in approaches. I mean, we can uh, we clearly have a uh, example of Israeli armed forces, what how they are conducting military operations and and how Russian forces are doing. And I know from uh, my relatives, I will add that uh, that were uh, in army in 2022 and uh, were participating in this uh, special military operation. They have a strict order in no circumstances open fire first and in no circumstances open fire if uh, they are civilians there. And unfortunately, the regime used this approach of Russian side and they were using civilians up front of their militaries and, are, and were ambushing Russian forces. That's that's uh, unfortunate reality that did happen in initial stages of the conflict. But to continue, to continue uh, our conversation, um, let's go to... Uh, Another a big topic, of course, uh, in the world, the Middle East. Um, what is your take on current current situation? Because uh, unfortunately, things like things are escalating as, as time goes by, and at this point, world is um, somewhat unable to force sides to conduct some peace talks and 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 escalate. Uh, what is your take on on the situation? Well, I must admit to, to feeling very, very depressed about the situation in relation to Israel and uh, Gaza. Um, firstly, I, I would like to, to emphasize for your, uh, for your viewers and uh, for you, the community that um, it's a, a little over a year ago since uh, the present government uh, was... Uh, put together in coalition uh, in, in Israel, and it has broken the status quo. Uh, there are now parties and people in government that have never been in government before, people that are maintaining Mr. Netanyahu in office, uh, who um, uh, would wish to... Uh, uh, not just crack down on uh, terrorism, uh, but in fact to remove the Palestinians from the land that they are living on. And um, this has broken uh, the, the status quo uh, in Israel. Um, it's a very right-wing government. Um, I feel uncomfortable even thinking about them, if I'm honest. Uh, the uh, British government, through its uh, foreign secretary, its foreign minister, David Cameron, has this week uh, issued a warning to what uh, Lord Cameron described as uh, extremist settlers in the West Bank to stop uh, using force and violence against those Palestinians that they are trying to remove uh, from their homes and to take over their property, which uh, uh, has been going on. And he said that uh, anybody found guilty of uh, doing such things will not be allowed to visit the United Kingdom. And this is uh, one of the few occasions when um, the government of the UK, and I think the government uh, um, most definitely in the United States, uh, though we haven't heard anything similar uh, from Washington yet, uh, highlights the fact that uh, there really are two sides to this story. There are far, far too many people in Western Europe who seem to accept the narrative that 
this all began with the terrible Hamas attack on Israel on October the 7th. But the reality is it's been going on for decades. Um, if you will, if you will permit me just to to, to make uh, one point, uh, a very personal point, uh, I stood up in the uh, British House of Commons, our parliament, uh, 30 years ago, and I said, and I quote, uh, Mr. Netanyahu is one of the biggest sim single stumbling blocks to peace in the Middle East. He was then, and he still is now. Uh, and um, uh, above all, we do need to have a, a ceasefire uh, in, in Israel. Uh, it's uh, absolutely tragic that um, uh, one or two governments in the West, uh, most notably in Washington, have been unable or unwilling to, to call for such, in spite of the overwhelming vote at the United Nations recently. Yes. Uh, we, need, we need to have a ceasefire. Uh, and um, uh, by all means, we can we can look in greater detail at what's been going on. Uh, but you asked me uh, my impression of the overall picture, uh, and that impression is that uh, the Israeli government is intending using the seventh of October as cover for what are regrettably uh, Zionist uh, policies of. Uh, removing Palestinians from the state of Israel one way or another. And Israel has also been provoking, provoking Hezbollah in Lebanon yes. in a manner which uh, uh, suggests to me that they're trying to widen this particular crisis, possibly with a view to trying to get uh, the involvement actively of the United States on the ground. The real risks of a much wider conflict uh, in the Middle East uh, is huge. That's that's what I'm afraid of, that uh, current government of Israel may provoke a full-scale confrontation between Israeli forces and Hezbollah. Then uh, Iran may, one way or another, get uh, involved in this confrontation, US and some other NATO member states, and. Uh, it will be devastation, total devastation, of course, for Middle East and the uh, entire world, I will say. That's quite unfortunate uh, development, uh, really. On, on, the, um, on the question of Iran, I hear it frequently said by many in the West that, uh, that uh, Iran is behind much of the... Unfortunately, we have some technical issues, but... Uh... Hopefully, we will resolve it. There's a 50. Uh, shall I start that again? There, there was a uh, last, yes, last sentence, please, Matthew. Uh, um, there was some I, technical I, glitch. I was referring to Iran. I'd just like to make the point that um, I often hear in the, in the West uh, the narrative that Iran is behind much of the trouble. Um, this is largely, of course, because many neocons, particularly in and around Washington, um, are, are very keen to uh, uh, escalate a conflict for some reason with Iran, um, which at the very least seems to be um, uh, remarkably stupid in my view. Um, but I would like to point out that uh, although there is a closeness between Hamas and uh, the Iranian government, uh, and uh, uh, it's perfectly fair to say that Hamas is, uh, is backed, um, it depends to the extent, but backed uh, by Iran, the Iranian president has actually, behind the scenes, been doing an awful lot to try to De to, to try to stabilize the situation. Uh, and I know that he has written to the heads of 50 different countries uh, in the region and, and key countries uh, in order to gain their support to help in that de-escalation de project. So I'm, I'm uh, always very concerned when I hear some people talking about Iran um, uh, that the, there are there are certainly uh, issues in in Iran, 
um, and um, the, 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 the Iranians are not the Iranian government is not flavor of the month with with many people in Washington. Um, but I think credit where it's due, the Iranian government and its president are trying to help in the de-escalation uh, uh, scenario. Um, but one other point when it comes to the region, the the Houthis in Yemen have been using some really quite advanced missiles uh, in order to uh, attack Israeli ships. Um, this has caused a huge problem. Uh, and it, it only needs something like that to get out of hand. And everybody um, in, in the West and Western Europe and the United States is going to know about it and it's going to directly affect us even though it's thousands of miles away because um uh if one looks at the straits of hormuz um uh, a very significant amount of oil is exported of um through the sea lanes uh, around this part of the world so uh, it's extremely important um and so and so my my, my overview um really is is one that um uh, the United States, uh, whose Congress uh, and Senate are allegedly, uh, according to Mr. Netanyahu, uh, controlled by the Israelis, and there's a lot of evidence um, to suggest that that is true. The Americans have at least said um, appalling words, in my view, but you, you've got a few weeks um, and precisely what they expect to to happen in those few weeks hardly bears thinking about um, but I have little doubt in my own mind that the 16,000 deaths or whatever the current figure today is but it's around that that have been announced by the um, the, the Palestinians Ministry of, of Health I think it's a fairly accurate figure uh, and uh, Israel has never, uh, with its overwhelmingly reservist uh, armed forces, the Israeli Defense Force, so-called, um, they are not trained in urban warfare. Uh, unlike Russia in Ukraine, they have not much of the time been able to, uh, with pinpoint accuracy, uh, send missiles to uh, kill specific people there has been much indiscriminate bombing and that is why the death toll is so high and those people have nowhere to go um president sisi of egypt does not wish to open um the border crossing uh, to allow the palestinians into egypt uh were they to go into Egypt, the Sinai Peninsula, um, it will destabilize Egypt, it will destabilize Jordan and other places that already have very, very significant refugee, Palestinian refugee problems. Uh, and um, uh, if they cannot go through the border uh, and Palestinians cannot disperse within what we know as Gaza today, what in the earth is going to happen to them? Surely Israel is not going to murder them all. The yeah, situation is uh, really tragic, uh, really tragic. And uh, as you just mentioned, uh, 16, 17,000 civilians have been killed just a uh, little over a month's period of time. When if you take a comparison with a special military operation, which is very intense uh, by all means, uh, clashes between Russian and Ukrainian forces. Uh, according to UN data, uh, number of uh, civilians killed are less, lower than casualties on uh, in the Gaza Strip. Of course, the death of uh, one uh, civilian is a tragedy, uh, but unfortunately, uh, collateral damage do happen during the military confrontations, but difference in operational style and tactics uh, between Russian and uh, IDF are just immense. It's like two different, two different worlds. Um, well, um, I, 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 I wonder, Levin, if it, could I could I just um, 
could I just mention for the benefit of your your viewers um, one personal uh, experience that I'd, I'd like to draw on um, and I have to accept I have to accept that uh, many people would regard my views as pro-Palestinian. Um, I am I am not an anti-Semite. I would I have advocated during my time in public life in UK um, always the two-state solution. I would like people to be able to live in harmony together. Although the Israeli government, um, not least in my own country, the UK, the Israeli ambassador in London has this very week uh, made it abundantly clear uh, that there will be no two-state solution and that reflects uh, very much the remarks I made earlier about the uh, relatively new government a year or so old with parties and people coming into government in in Israel for the first time that that actually other parties had managed to keep out of government um, for this very reason. Um, I, when I was a member of parliament, uh, politely declined on three occasions an invitation to visit Israel, which effectively, although it came to a third party, effectively was from the Israeli government. And I politely refused it, th those invitations. And Israel is probably about the only country in the Middle East that I haven't ever visited. Uh, I, I did not go because I considered it then, and I consider those visits now, to be propagandist uh, briefings um, where very considerable pressure is applied. And this is recent recent visit of Musk, for example. That was pure propaganda action, in my opinion. So I have to yes. agree with you. Well, I I I, I respect your point, um, but I just I just wanted to I just wanted to make that point um, that a considerable amount of pressure was applied on me when I was a member of Parliament, going back 30, 35 years, uh, and um, and and it's even worse now where where most members of Congress and the Senate rely on money that is effectively American-Israeli money uh, in order to fund their re-election campaigns. It's, it's rather a, a vicious cycle, if I, I, if I could put it that way. Uh, and so they're not terribly well-placed to speak truth under, uh, unto power. And it's particularly difficult when the United States actually has a very important role here. Uh, that um, Anthony Blinken uh, for years has been um, uh, effectively uh, a lobbyist for, for Israel uh, and uh, Biden himself has um, very, very uh, long-standing links uh, to um, individuals and organizations in Israel. Um, and this is at a time when really we could do with as many of the key uh, opinion formers um, taking a, a, a sensible diplomatic middle of the road uh, line in trying to bring the two parties together. And if I did, if I did not make it clear when, when, uh, or I did not emphasise it enough when I said earlier, um, I made remarks about October the seventh. Um, I absolutely condemned what Hamas did on October oh, the seventh. And I condemn all violence, wherever it comes from. Uh, but in this regard, if I appear to some as being pro-Palestinian, it is that they are, the overwhelming majority of Palestinians are not armed. They're not uh, militant. Um, I think they're pretty weary of the way that they've been treated over so many years. They are just uh, people who want to live uh, in peace uh, and, and deserve uh, peace i mean uh, absolutely. as you mentioned as you mentioned two state solution uh, was uh, voted for as i understand in un and uh, supposed to be implemented but 
Yes. Yet again, as you mentioned, Israeli ambassador in UK just in this week denied any chances for two-state solutions. So where is the solution then? That's uh, that's a question, isn't it? What what I'm hoping is what I'm hoping is that um, at a, a at a point in the not too distant future, notwithstanding what I said about Hezbollah being provoked by the Israelis, um, issues relating to Houthis. Um, the, the other issues uh, in the Middle East, because um, American military targets are, are being attacked by uh, groups uh, in countries like Syria and Iraq, for example. Well, all these reasons together are why the powder keg could blow up into a huge conflict very quickly if we're not careful. Um, we, I believe that a, a, a ceasefire... Um, and the possibility of trying to uh, revamp, and this is this is very much an American view, but it's one that I myself would be prepared to to run with to a certain extent if it helped solve the the conflict. Um, the Palestinian Authority hasn't had elections for years. Now it may well be, that some people who are closely associated with or are members of Hamas who actually might stand for election in the future and be elected. One reason in the past why Hamas did so well at, uh, at an election was they, they looked after what I uh, would describe as poor people. Uh, and um, I think if, if there can be a ceasefire, and emphasis can be given to revamping the Palestinian Authority. Um, because giving Israeli citizens, who are not necessarily Zionists, confidence in the future that the communities can live side by side is absolutely vital. And at the present moment in time, although Mr. Netanyahu is deeply, deeply unpopular. Uh, there is a mass movement, which includes a lot of Israelis who don't regard themselves as Zionists, who actually do want to see the back and the death of Hamas. Um, as a, somebody who did wear a, an army uniform myself years ago and did undergo some training in, in urban warfare uh, and anti-terrorist matters, uh, Whilst the Israeli Defense Force are not really very well equipped in terms of training for urban uh, warfare, uh, the, um, uh, the 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 greater likelihood uh, of um, uh, the opportunity of, of having a, a ceasefire so that um, uh, the IDF will not continue to sustain the. Uh, often not publicized huge casualties that they are uh, uh, they are seeing at the present moment in time because they're not used to or trained in in urban uh, urban fighting uh, I think I think they would benefit from it as as well and I think that uh, um, trying to find a, a way of, of revamping the Palestinian Authority to satisfy Israeli feelings uh, but also to stop the the war on the Palestinians themselves uh, is the way forward. So um, I would not, uh, uh, and I don't expect, I, I would not be pressing for anything approaching a two-state solution at the present moment in time. I don't think that that's going to work um, possibly at all. Um, but what can work is living in peace and harmony together. Uh, if um, uh, if certain uh, issues relating to the Palestinian Authority and Israeli public opinion can be satisfied, because we can't go on as we are. They're simply killing each other. Yes, unfortunately, unfortunately, at this point, uh, I truly don't see any prospects of uh, achieving ceasefire and uh, what is uh, uh, very depressing that world world community is in large failing to 
uh, to press both sides to begin uh, peace, peace talks and uh, negotiations. And as a result, thousands and thousands of uh, killed uh, civilians. And uh, to continue, I, I know uh, uh, you're already busy and I will just have a few more, few more questions. Um, I have to ask about uh, G7. I have to ask about um, BRICS relationships between two blocks and how you see uh, future development of this world if we take in account that uh, it's definitely forming like two major economical blocks at this point. One side is G7 and the allies, let's say, on, a, on another side, BRICS, which will become even bigger organization from 1st of January. Uh, 2024, when a number of countries uh, will join uh, BRICS uh, organization. Uh, how you see relationships between two blocks and uh, in which direction the world is heading at this at this point? Um, well, uh, it's very significant, of course, that Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are joining. Uh, uh, it's huge, of the, course. The, the, um, um, uh, to some extent, I think... Um, uh, I think that uh, many countries are really, if I could put it this way, a little bit fed up with the United States telling everybody how they should behave all the time. Um, but obviously there are clear economic factors as well. Change will evolve very, very slowly. I expect the G7 and BRICS to live in uh, harmony for uh, quite a long time. Uh, there are some opportunities in the new year. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that um, the chairmanship is being taken over yes. um, by by Russia. Yes. Um, I think, by the way, that we're going to see BRICS um, flexing its muscles um, within the international community regarding Israel and Gaza. Uh, as soon as we get into 2024. Um, but um, the uh, reliance on the dollar, uh, the reliance on some of the, the, the old ways of doing things for so very long uh, is beginning to change. Uh, and uh, I, 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 welcome, I welcome what uh, BRICS is, is doing. Uh, they... Uh, uh, they, uh, the countries involved, uh, in my view, are really wanting to uh, build uh, a world order, if you like, which is for the benefit of everyone living on the same planet um, in as much harmony as possible. And that where there's conflict, it should be largely the conflict of um, business competition uh, rather than military conflict. Uh, and uh, wh whether, in fact, BRICS decides it's going to set up its new, its own equivalent of the International Monetary Fund, and when you look at its members, it could afford to do so, uh, then I think that there, there will be, um, uh, there will be a very different uh, feel to the way that uh, business and politics are going to be done in uh, over the next decade. And I anticipate that BRICS will grow membership wise. Uh, there are other countries wanting to join. Uh, and this will, this, will be, uh, this will be a good thing. Um, of course, the older countries in, in, in the G7 uh, n may feel slightly threatened, um, but, but so be it. Um, I think uh, positive change is a good thing. And I think the development of BRICS uh, is something that is very positive. Uh, after all, after all, uh, G7 members can uh, change their policies and, and uh, be more, let's say, <coughs> uh, more cooperative uh, with, uh, with the BRICS. Why not? And uh, just, on, uh, just on point, uh, at this point, uh, Saudi Arabia, as you mentioned, and the UAE going to join. This is a huge number of other countries also. But uh, I'm, I mentioned this too because Saudi Arabia is a major uh, country when it comes to uh, world energy market and the United Arab Emirates are becoming modern-day Switzerland, if, if, uh, if you like, because um, 
unfortunately because of the policies of uh, current government in Switzerland uh, this state did lose uh, worldwide um, reputation of being neutral and and uh, outflow of investments from Switzerland is huge and where this money is going usually into United Arab Emirates so it's it's uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all if uh, uh, UAE gonna become a next major financial center in this in this world it's, it's quite possible well um, I I would like to I, I would like to um, to make uh, one cautionary note um, and I, I declare an interest for your uh, viewers that uh, I was for seven years a paid advisor to the government of Dubai, and I have very strong links with UAE. Um, I would like to see the United Arab Emirates undertaking um, an improvement in its financial regulation and where it accepts money and deposits from. Uh, I'm not suggesting it should act as a world policeman, um, but I think it needs to be uh, and continue to be a transparent uh, jurisdiction. Uh, and um, uh, Switzerland is Switzerland. But we all know that uh, some of the money that's been locked away in its... Um, uh, old banks uh, ha has come from sometimes some rather dubious sources, and I, I think yes, I think yes. sometimes in what I'll call in the new world, um, uh, because if you want to set up a, a, a business in a in a low tax or no tax uh, uh, environment, um, a country like UAE uh, is very attractive. I, I, I just hope that um, uh, the regulatory authorities there um, keep an eye on things and don't uh, uh, let uh, and learn from the mistakes that we've seen perhaps in other countries um, but nevertheless you no know, BRICS is is already proving to be a huge success uh, and um, uh, as I mentioned uh, I think uh, in the new year we're going to see BRICS uh, uh, flexing its muscles um, in relation to world opinion uh, concerning uh, Gaza uh, and Israel, and that will be a good thing um, because yeah. we cannot uh, we cannot wait uh, just for uh, the United States. But I think I think I think America will change its tune in in the new year. Um, at the moment, uh, there are politicians in the United States who don't feel that they can speak out or put pressure on the Israeli government uh, when, in fact, some pressure needs to be applied. And uh, Matthew, uh, I have to ask, fine, uh, as, as towards the end of uh, our conversation, about um, relationships between Russia and uh, and uh, Western states, in in uh, in particular with uh, with UK, uh, do you see any chances that in foreseeable future relationships may improve between uh, Moscow and major capitals in the world, uh, in the Western world, including London, or it's just uh, non-starter at this point? Um, well, could I could I? Uh... Could I say that I always see uh, the possibility of improvement in relations between one or two Western countries and uh, uh, including the United Kingdom, of course, uh, and the Russian Federation? Uh, it is going to take time. Uh, at the moment, um, at the moment, um, in the United States and the United Kingdom in particular, uh, there is um, almost an ideological issue with um, uh, criticism and dislike of the Russian Federation, often by many people who actually don't know any Russians and have never been to the Russian Federation either, I might add. Um, there is also, I sense, um, a feeling of being utterly perplexed uh, in Russia, uh, because many Russians simply don't understand um, 
quite why they are regarded as the enemy. Absolutely. When really, Russia is is not our enemy. Absolutely. Uh, the 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 uh, I think the situation will will calm. It will improve. And if you remember earlier in the program, I said that I felt that Ukraine, which is really the stumbling block in all of this, um, will look more like Cyprus and a divided island, uh, a divided island more and more in future. Things will calm down. People will get on with their lives. Uh, that's what I envisage. Um, as to whether it will take five years, ten years, the first thing we have to do, of course, is, is see uh, an end to, to, to the military conflict uh, uh, in Ukraine. But I, but I do, um, I, when I think back to um, the fall of the Berlin Wall and um, uh, the uh, so-called collapse of the Soviet Union, the the whole economy of Russia uh, was taken apart, often by uh, Western <laughs> interests, uh, who sought to take advantage of many of the uh, uh, natural mineral wealth uh, uh, and uh, uh, infrastructure uh, of Russia. Uh, and then uh, when things went a bit too far, a man called Vladimir Putin came on the scene <coughs> and he put a stop to a lot of the things that should never have been happening. And uh, he has given Russians back considerable pride in their country to the extent that now with Western sanctions being imposed as they are, the Russian economy is still doing very much better the most Western European countries and the United States at this particular time in becoming self-sufficient in so very many areas. Um, the last time I was in Moscow, I noticed <coughs> how cheap, how, with the inability to import, um, uh, for example, French cheese, how the uh, agricultural products of uh, the Russian Federation had improved uh, immeasurably, and that's what's happened in so many areas. You hear it these days in relation to um, uh, military matters uh, and, and technology, but it's right the way through, um, particularly in agriculture. Uh, and um, uh, Russia is proving to uh, be a robust country with a robust uh, economy and a very proud history. And I very much hope, and I, and I do believe, in my lifetime, uh, that uh, I will be able to once again uh, visit Russia and take with me people, uh, for the best of reasons, wish to undertake business with Russia and Russians and not initiate conflict. Uh, well, uh, I will end this uh, interview now. Thank you very much, Matthew, for participating for this great, great, very interesting Thank conversation. Uh, Thank you for asking me, because of course I'm a viewer too, you know, and a member of the community. Uh, Thank you for for that also, and hopefully we will repeat sometime in the future interview if we will if you will have. A, Time. Uh, I, I want to thank all the members of our community for joining the uh, streams. Have a great day, everybody, and um, take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.